Digimon was pretty weird. So, I just spent three days of my life binging Digimon for this review, and I gotta say, it sure was a show. It was a piece of watchable Japanese animation. Now, of course, I did enjoy parts of Digimon because it wasn't bad, but most of it I thought was pretty average. Until near the end when all of the characters are finalizing their arcs. That's when it got really good. But hey, put aside your nostalgia bias. By the way, I have no nostalgia for Digimon for this review, since I did have a few issues with it that people may disagree with. But if you do disagree, I don't care. It's my video. Spoiler warning. I will go into depth into Digimon, and I will spoil things. If you haven't and want to watch the original Digimon Adventures English subtitled version from 1999 that's available on the internet for free, then hey, don't watch this video. For whatever reason, even though I binged every single episode of Digimon English Sub 21 Hours of Digimon, I can't remember the names of some of the Digimon because they're similar. So they're similar, like I think this is Gabumon. Gabumon? Like, I don't fucking know, man. So I'll just quickly give the main Digimon goofy little memorable names, unless I don't for some reason and I actually call them by their real name. If you're not watching, check the screen so that you know what I'm talking about. Dynamon, Wolfmon, Jomon, Tentamon, I just remember that one's name. Birdmon, you know what that is. Plant, Angelwoman, and Patamon. So I heard you're having trouble sleeping. Because I also just remembered his name. The animation is standard for this type of anime and for when it came out. There are some incredibly noticeable animation errors, like when a character moves over and the bottom of their body is cut off because like part of them was off stream. And there are some odd fight scenes where it really feels like they're fighting too slowly. Other than those two things though, I don't see much wrong with the animation. Sure, the animations in each fight are reused freaking relentlessly. That's more of a fault on the budget, because I assume it wasn't high budget for the amount of times they have to reuse animations for fights. If there's a fight scene with Dynamon or Patamon, for example, you can bet that if they're using the third form, they're certainly going to be spamming the same Baby Flame or Airshot animation. It's an absolute guarantee. It's super noticeable, but again, other than that, the animation is fine. Also, the 3D models in this actually look pretty cool, and the animations are pretty good. Well, except Mecha Greymon. He looks kind of funny, but I'll let it slide since 3D slash CGI stuff at the time was pretty new. The Chosen Children, originally 7 but later 8, oh no. have to bring balance to the Digimon world and stop all the evil bad guys. These bad guys in order of appearance are Devimon, Edamon, Vandamon, and this clown guy I forgot the name of. I forgot it at the time of writing the script, even though I literally just got done watching the last episode an hour ago at the time of writing the script. All of these guys want to rule the world really badly and be really bad to people, but the Chosen Children and the Chosen Digimon were chosen to kill all of them and stop them. And thankfully, they succeed. Obviously, right? It'd be really sad if they didn't. They also go into the real world for a little bit, because Vandemon invaded the real world, because he's literally just that evil that he went into real life. And also, some really weird scenes happen, like this one. This is a kid's show, by the way. Um, and also, when Vandemon says he's going to kill every single child. If Angemon didn't tell the truth, he'd kill every single kid that was there. Like, when he said that, I was like, oh my god, what the heck? This is for kids, right? But, yeah, um, I didn't watch the dub. Maybe they changed it? I don't know, dude. Now that you should understand the plot of the story better, if you remember it, or if you've never even seen Digimon and don't care about watching it, I'll talk about each saga and give my thoughts about them. Now, before we continue, I'll do this early. If you're enjoying this video already, give it a like and subscribe to my channel so that more people can see my video and so that I can grow as a content creator. Having people that watch my videos would actually be pretty cool since I want people to watch my videos obviously. And I mean, nobody just uploads to upload on this platform. Everybody wants their video to be seen. This arc was so goddamn in the middle of good and bad, but it's not painfully average. Painfully average, though, is the worst that something could possibly be, though. Basically, this is where we start. This is where the humans are introduced, the children, I mean, and the Digimon are introduced. Everything is introduced here. The first issue that I have with this arc is that everything is paced to happen so quickly. Like, how the children instantly grow a strong relationship with the Digimon, or how Dynamon and Birdmon 
quickly learn how to evolve on command off screen when before they hardly knew how evolutions work and also evolutions were only triggered by strong emotions of the digimon's owners and also them learning this so suddenly isn't given an explanation or something or like a scene of them learning it they just do it when Joe's in trouble. I would have liked it if there was maybe a scene of Dynamon and Taichi practicing on how to evolve on command one night, and then they figure it out and tell everybody to help everyone. More character development in time could have been used to strengthen the relationship of the children and Digimon early on, but I understand that as the series goes on, the characters' relationships with the Digimon would strengthen naturally. But still, I would have appreciated more scenes like how when Joe went out with Jomon on that one night, it was just really fun to watch because they're really fun to watch. Our big bad guy, Devamon, is also introduced here. He has no personality traits other than, I'm so freaking evil, I want to take over the world. Sometimes a villain doesn't need to be deep or have a complex personality or anything, but this I'm evil as a main villain personality is a common and constant thing in the show for whatever ungodly reason. And the only exception to a main villain not just being evil to be evil is Edamon. The Black Gears are also in this arc and only in this arc thankfully. Basically if you don't remember or if you didn't watch Digimon, the Black Gears were things created by Devamon to turn good Digimon into evil Digimon that want to kill the chosen children, like Leomon for example. And when a Black Gear gets into a Digimon, they'll follow every command that Devamon says. This ability that Devamon has to instantly change any Digimon's allegiance sounds incredibly overpowered and broken, and also pretty cool, but the main problem is that it's incredibly broken, and also is said to not have any restrictions. Yep, that's right, the power of the Black Ears is never established, so it's possible that Devamon could have just used the Black Ears on every incredibly strong Digimon on File Island to attack the group all at the same time, as soon as he knew where they were and the fact that they were on File Island. But he obviously never does this because there wouldn't be any show. Or even if he couldn't do that, like let's say that he could only corrupt three monsters at once, he could still have the three monsters behind him as he fights them, especially with his death claw move, which lets him touch other people's hearts. That move alone could have easily beaten everyone if he were to attack everyone as soon as he knew the location of the chosen children and the fact that they made it to Fire Island. This was also a theme for most villains, excluding Edamon, since Edamon didn't know where they were half the time and when he knew, he attacked immediately. Pretty much all the villains in this just try to let their underlings kill the good guys when they themselves, for zero reason, don't just kill them themselves. They get many, many opportunities to kill them as well, which just logically doesn't make any sense. For some reason, logical inconsistencies or things that don't make any sense really mess with me a lot, so I'm just saying that. And for Devamon himself, there's nothing in his personality or anything that stops him from going to kill the kids himself as soon as he possibly can. I mean, I get it, there has to be a show, but it doesn't make any sense. They could have made the villain more balanced or made it so that he had no chance of knowing what the children were because they always hid their position or something like that. I think it would have been cooler if the Black Gears were Digimon themselves that worshipped Devimon and did evil things in order to summon him by possessing different Digimon that were good in order to do those evil things. That would have been way more interesting in my opinion. I also know that the main villain having way more powerful than the protagonist and knowing about where the protagonist is and not killing them for no reason is a common thing, especially in a lot of animes, but that isn't a reason or a good thing, and every time I see it, I just get annoyed. Back to the Black Gears though. I feel like Devimon could have used one on one of the main characters Digimon instead of just random Digimon scattered across the island. Seeing Dynamon being controlled by a Black Gear or even Wolfmon being controlled by a Black Gear would have been interesting and fun to watch. In the entire time when I finally knew what the Black Gears were, I was just wondering like why didn't Devimon use them to possess one of the main Digimon that we always watch? Of course, why is never answered and of course this also never happens which is a major bummer. Does, do people still say bummer? I don't know. The Black Gears were also overused. I actually got tired of the use of Black Gears because it got old quickly. If a Digimon was evil in File Island, then you could bet your ass that it was because he was being possessed by a Black Gear. The entire point was to kill Devimon because he wanted to kill the chosen children and use a Black Gear to take over the world or something, or at least File Island, but a little less could have helped. It made every fight's outcome predictable. Almost every fight on File Island went bad guy spotted. Take a little damage. Evolve. Get the Black Gear out of them. Hey friend, 
literally almost every fight was like that. It's a really good thing the Black Gears were connected to Devimon, and they weren't ever used again outside of Fire Island, except that one time after Devimon died, which I thought was really weird. But hey, even though I said so many negative things about the villain in this arc's main purpose, I still don't hate it. I actually don't hate any arc in this. It's just that this specific arc wasn't great or horrible. It's full of issues like the pacing that's too quick with sudden jarring developments in the main characters, and the villain that could have simply wiped out everyone if he wasn't waiting for no reason. But as I said earlier, this arc is so freaking in the middle of good and bad that I'd give it a 5 out of 10. I did not rank any other arc, I'll just do it after I'm done reading this stuff. I don't have as many issues with this arc than the last, and I actually think it's one of the best because it made a lot of sense. Firstly, the villain. The villain Edamon is actually really fun to watch, and I wanted to see him more, because he's freaking insane and egotistical. He thinks he's a star and stuff, and he wants to kill the children because I don't remember, actually. And I probably don't remember because Edamon was just really freaking fun to watch on the screen. He was insane and egotistical, which made him way unlike all of the strongest villains of past and future. The server continent was also where the main characters got their crests. And the crests let Digimon super evolve into the perfect and ultimate forms, which is cool I guess. As I said, I don't have many issues with this arc because it was pretty good. It feels like so long ago that I watched this arc, even though it was probably like two days ago. So I can't really recall any specifics because I mean, it kind of meshed together in my brain. I don't know exactly why. I mean, I can remember Fire Island and all the other arcs way more easily than the Server Continent arc for whatever reason. But all I wished is that there are more bad guys like Edamon or bad guys with as much personality as him since Edamon was freaking awesome. Plus, unlike a few of these arcs, nothing was predictable. I couldn't guess what Edamon was going to do or later in the arc what Nanamon was going to do. I mean, actually, you know what? It was a little predictable with Nanamon. Like, I really felt like he was going to betray them and he did. It was, it was just a thought in the back of my head. This guy's totally going to betray them. And you know what? He did. That was the only predictable part that I can remember. And I also actually forgot to mention something. This clip right here. It's probably because there's a rift in another dimension over there. What the fuck does this mean? I mean seriously, Jomon has never been shown previously to create dimensions for his marching fist to come out of, and it's never been established before this, and nothing about another dimension has even been mentioned in this anime before Koshiro said this. So this is just a incredibly confusing line. I expected it to be answered later, but that never happened, and I can't assume things from this either because it's just like a throwaway line that has such an extreme and odd important implications. Doesn't mean the place that like um, Jomon was summoning his marching fish from? I don't know. I thought maybe it's a subtitling mistake, but I checked both subtitle versions of the Digimon I had, one from the website that I mostly watched it on, and an anime app on my phone, but it said the exact same thing. So unless two people made the exact same mistake and put the exact same words, then if anyone can explain this line to me in the comments, then please do. Honestly, this is still bothering me. So, this was the arc where the main cast went to the real world and found the 8th chosen child, Hikari, which is Taichi's sister. The only have a problem with Hikari's character, since she's just an incredibly simple character and more so a key to move along the plot than an actual character, I kind of enjoyed this arc. Again, this arc is all about Hikari and her new Digimon, who was originally with Vandemon because he helped her, I think. Although he beat her like every single day because of her eyes, and because he beat her so badly, she had scars on her hands, so she wears gloves. Like, uh, I don't know why Digimon has randomly dark things in it for absolutely no reason, but it does. Just why? I don't know. Anyway, anyway, continuing as the art goes on, you'd be like, wow, this guy's like Devimon, but he's a vampire. And you'd be right. Again, he's just Devimon. He's a freaking Devimon reskin. Most of the main bad guys are just Devimon reskinned and stronger, which is unfortunate. Also, we get our first memorable casualty.
the death of Wizardmon. I mean, I saw it coming after his backstory with how Hikari's Digimon Angel Woman saved his life and how he would do anything with her and for her if she asked. Still though, as I watched, I enjoyed this character. Reserved guy who's incredibly loyal to a person that saved his life. It's totally understandable. And although he didn't have the most screen time, he was still great to watch while he was alive. In the end, the whole fight against Vandemon was pretty cool. And the whole thing where they went to the real world with Digimon was awesome and fun to watch. And also Vandemon's transformation was pretty cool. Actually, now that I look at it more, yeah, no, the big bad guys have the same as devilish humanoid design. They literally all have the same body type. I wouldn't be surprised if they're all the same height as well. I really feel like they got really lazy, honestly, with these two parts with the bad guys, specifically the villains. I don't know why they chose these lame fucking bastards to be the bad guys. They could have had more people like Edamon. I was like, oh my god, Edamon is so cool. But no, they just have more Devamon reskins here on out. I mean, later on, the freaking, like, Elite Four guys, like evil Elite Four guys. They like, I mean, they're all cool except Paimon, the clown guy. He's so lame. He's literally just Devamon again. <laughs> We're continuing with the Fire Island Round Two War. The second time on Fire Island is when the story got more serious, and it was when the four bads were released: Pinocchio, Metal Snake, Mecha Godzilla, and Paimon. But. Pinocchio was the most fun to watch. I know that they're supposed to kill the chosen children, but I didn't expect him to use actual real guns to shoot and kill all of the kids. Mostly because this is a kid's show and all, a lot of the show honestly gets into a weird gray area as so to like who's the demographic, maybe teenagers? The Snake and Paimon are boring, but Mechagodzilla and Pinocchio were really fun to watch. Honestly, if Mechagodzilla was the main big bad guy, I think I would have enjoyed this arc more and it would have been more unique instead of just another Devilmon reskin. A giant robot army versus all of the good guys would have been awesome, but of course, Paimon, the reskin of Devil slash Vamdemon, was a real big bad guy. Predictably, obviously, right? The only thing that separates him from the two others is that he has a white cloak that makes Digimon and people into toys. And he's also a clown. Um, yeah, with cool swords. That's, that's all he had. Compare this to even Paimon, who had a bullet hammer, which everything he hit blew up and like, went the fire, which was really cool. And he also had the ability to use strings and control people like puppets. And he also created an entire force to screw with people. And he also had a map with toys of the people who went into it. And whatever he did to the, um, the toys of the people happened to the actual people. So if he just shot the people, every single toy with a magnum, they would have all died. But he didn't. You know why? Because he has a childish personality that enjoys playing with things, unlike Paimon, who wouldn't have minded killing every chosen child as soon as he knew where they are because he's evil. And that's all he is. I would like to note that Paimon and the other, uh, the fucking evil Fantastic Four, they did let them off. I mean, they found them as as soon as the chosen children went to file island but they didn't kill them um i don't understand exactly why i don't remember why but someone leave in the comments as to why because i forgot to mention that that's my freaking problem with these villains anyway all that i'm saying is that the main antagonist in the end was boring and lame and the way he went out was laughable he went through a freaking gate he died to a gate Although, the final final bad guy was pretty cool. He was basically every villain that they beat combined into one, which was obviously awesome. And since he only existed for like two episodes, his personality didn't matter as much as Paimon or the other three big bads. This is also when the main character's arcs finished up. Like Joe's arc into becoming less cowardly and even more selfless, or Mimi's arc after becoming more compassionate due to all the losses of life. Taichi is one of the simpler characters. Throughout the story, he's pretty much the leader archetype character in a lot of other shows. He's the shonen protagonist, thrown through. He's just the guy that gives the orders to the other characters, and someone the other characters sort of look up to. Of course, he changes and matures as the story goes on, like when he faced his fear of dying horribly to save Sora, or when he tried to walk away from Yamato when Yamato tried to fight him for personal reasons. But other than small changes with his character, nothing big happens to him like with Joe, Yamato, or Mimi. But hey, thankfully he isn't perfect. His strategy for most fights is just to recklessly run in and fight the enemy, which doesn't work out perfectly all the time. And his personality contrasts Yamato's greatly, which always causes him to argue and stuff. But I'll talk about that more in the Yamato section. His relationship with the Digimon Dynamon is simple, they're like normal friends. Obviously, Dynamon will protect Taichi with his life since that's what he has to do because he was chosen to do that, 
but I don't think that that should be a factor here since that's what all the Digimon do. Compared to everyone else, their relationship feels very surface level and simple, especially when compared to the other relationships that others have with their Digimon, like Yamato's strong relationship with Wolfmon or Joe's fun relationship with Jomon, or even Takeru's somewhat rocky relationship with Patamon. Their connection never wavers, improves, or anything like that as the series goes on. Taichi is by no means a flat character, but he's too simple. Yamato is the antithesis to Taichi, and if I could describe him in two words, it'd be he's a sort of a lone wolf. In the start, he goes against literally everything that Taichi says, and, and they even fight once early on because of a disagreement. But of course, they make up shortly afterward. The one thing Yamato cares about most in the series is his brother, since he's always worried about him and always wants him to be safe, which is really nice. But, as his brother grows into a more self-sufficient person, he wants to stop being babied around by Yamato, which really messes him up since Yamato actually relied on his brother, Takeru, relying on him. And due to this tree guy convincing him of, like, friendship stuff, bad friendship stuff, bad advice, yeah, he begins to question uh, what friendship really is, and that causes the fight between him and Taichi. But in the end, he finds himself and is way nicer to everybody, because he found out what friendship really is. And he lets Takeru do things on his own without his major supervision or protection. I think that this character arc that he goes through is really nice and it's a good way to close off a character that I thought just disliked Taichi until the end. His relationship with his Digimon Wolfmon is also incredibly strong. Since I feel like Wolfmon was really down to do anything that Yamato asked. Since when on the inside he disagreed with him trying to fight Taichi, he still did it since he's Yamato's Digimon. And that's what Yamato wanted. The Zijimon would do anything that Yamato wanted. Seriously, like, it's it's really great. I like watching these two guys. And throughout the series, their interactions were uh, cool as well. They're simply two good characters. I could describe this guy's arc so easy. He's childish and a baby at the start, and then at the end, he's not. I feel neutral to his character. His crying isn't annoying or anything because he doesn't do it like constantly, and he's also useful, and I never felt any level of dislike to Takeru, but I never felt any positive feelings when watching him either. Obviously, he's important because he's Yamato's brother, and without him, a key element to Yamato's art would be missing, and I kind of feel like that that's all his character was for. Not to the level of Hikari, but that's just how I feel about him. Also, he's also there to have the third most powerful Digimon on Team Angemon, and also his relationship with Panamon is rocky, like I said in the Taichi section. They disagree and argue every once in a while more than anyone else with their Digimon, but they're still really good friends that work well together and that need each other in the Digimon world. And they've been through a lot together. He's simply the team's child that grows into not being as much of a child, but there's not really much to say other than that. <laughs> Joe's the best character in the show. He starts off as a sort of cowardly nerd guy who always wants to follow the rules, but he develops to become the most brave, selfless, and sincere character in this entire show. He always, without question or hesitation, puts others' lives above his own because he's the oldest and he has to protect everybody. The reason is a little goofy or wacky, if you will, but that's his reason and he always sticks to it, which I find really respectable. He also is the most rational out of the entire team, I'd say, and he's always trying to keep people civil, and he's always trying to find the most sensible and safest way to do whatever they have to do next, as long as he's with the team. Plus, his interactions with Jomon are super fun to watch. I actually wish that there are more interactions between Jomon and Joe, because they synergize so well together. Like, look at this clip, it's really nice. <laughs> ついてくるな。僕は一人で行く。別に、オイラもあの山に用があるんだ。
手にしろまったく素直じゃないな蝶は何が一人じゃ心細かったんだろバカ言うな言って言って気にすんな<笑> Pretty much everything that has to do with them together is funny or wholesome. I can't believe I'm going to use that word, but wholesome and entertaining to watch since they clearly care a lot about each other and like their personalities perfectly complement each other. If this pair isn't your favorite to watch, then I can never guess which pair you like the most. Yamato, I guess, maybe. I don't know. Mimi is a simple character with a pretty good arc. She starts off as a female character that likes to be pretty and stuff in a lot of other children's shows since everybody has a very clearly defining character trait. But later, after all the losses of life that happens for their goal, she begins to hate fighting. And she also becomes less preppy and lazy and she also becomes more grateful when compared to her in the beginning. The character change is really cemented when she helps Ogremon, who previously in the file saga tried to kill them because of Devimon's orders. She became the princess for the frog people because she has a really good singing voice and that's what's needed to awaken their king because he has he lost in a karaoke battle this is why i said the show is weird but anyway that happened and i was like wow that's super in character for her and honestly i wish that there were more moments of this where the main character's flaws were showcased heavily in a way to show the bad side of them because i find showcasing major flaws in the character in a way that could be resolved quickly fun some things i don't know how to describe like her relationship with the plant i mean it's standard i guess i mean it's like below average i guess in friendships like it's not really a good one since plant clearly cares a lot more about her in the start and the feelings clearly aren't as reciprocated but well thankfully when the series is ending mimi cares way more about plant which is obviously nice since plant literally risks their life every day in fights that they could die in to make sure that mimi and all the other chosen children are safe Here's the smart guy, technician, whatever, I mean, that's basically it. In his heart, he just wants to know everything because he's a smart guy and he's curious of everything ever. And he tells a group important things about the Digimon that they're facing so they can uh, learn a little more about them. And that's basically all he is. I mean, he barely changes throughout the story, at least in a way that I saw. He gets more guts, I guess, and he gets a little smarter and he... He learns how to decipher more codes, I guess. Um, but that doesn't actually change his personality or how he acts, really. He's still the same old formal Koshiro as he was in the start. He becomes more grateful, I guess. But that's more personality off-screen type thing. But you know what? His backstory with him actually being adopted by his parents is pretty good and well executed. But other than that, he's the technician. And I actually forgot to write about how Tentamon and him interact. So I'll do it off-script. Tentamon doesn't exactly understand Koshiro, but they still interact pretty well because their personalities complement each other, just like most other characters in this series. Now we're on to the two characters I don't know how to describe. Sora, I don't know how to describe her, which is what I literally just said seconds ago. Which means that she's either way too complex for my tiny little mind to understand, or her personality is so nothing that I have no word to describe her with. I'm sure that she has a personality, just not a really defining trait, and with defining traits I can more easily see a character, so that's probably my issue. If you could describe Sora in depth and as in like in a paragraph and leave it in the comments, you know, I'll, I'll read that, I'll be checking the comments seen like weekly or something for probably like a like two months to see if anyone has left that comment but um i'll see if i agree or not but anyway from what i gathered from watching um i'll just make a guess she likes soccer so she must be a tomboy she also loves her digimon and friends because she has a crest of love since she really does care about her digimon a lot a lot um her digimon has a more describable personality than her she's compassionate and sociable but she's a flat character because she stays like that for the entire series. Like every other Digimon, I think. No, I know. Every other Digimon is a flat character. They all don't change, which is completely fine because they're just compliments to their main characters that help them change and grow as people. But let's just move on to the eighth child and what I think is the worst main character. Hikari, a character I can't describe. I mean, she's nice, as Taichi said, and as I saw, she puts others' happiness over herself, as shown in a um, flashback, but other than that, I can't describe her. But none of that is important, actually. Her importance lies not in her personality, 
or her actions, but because she's the eighth child. The hidden one, the unknown one for half the series. She was also the most feared kid in uh, the Vandemon saga, since they always wanted to find and kill her, and specifically her. But other than that, she's basically godlike in the Digimon world, because she glowed and then like a lot of new Aemon ran over to her and praised her. Why? Well, I don't know for certain, but I assume it's because one of the formless Digimon possessed her a little while ago, and then I assume that the formless Digimon gave them gave her powers. Other than my guess, the reason is completely unknown to me because this never happens again and is not explained. She's just holy because she is the eighth child. Her relationship with her Digimon is really simple. I mean, I have literally nothing to say. That's all I wrote in this script. I mean, it's positive, honestly, and her Digimon will protect her over her life, but that's literally every other Digimon. Um, her Digimon does go through an arc of self-reflectance or self-finding out, finding out herself, you know, because she had to find out that she was in fact, the 8th Digimon for the 8th Chosen Child. That is what she had to do because she was working for Vandemon, who I want to remind you beat her every single day because her eyes. He didn't like her eyes. No siree. Oh, those eyes were... Those eyes are so nasty. Oh wait, no. Those eyes are filled full of hope. I can't have any hope in my evil world because I'm so... I'm so evil. I live to be evil. I mean, I know the personality traits says Vandemon. Anyway, I'm getting so off script right now. Um, also, um, her Digimon got a massive nerf. I mean, big. I swear, like, she went from being able to fight every main character in her ultimate perfect or adult form to never fighting again in her adult form. Like, no, actually, we're 52 minutes into recording right now. Um, wow, this video's long. Anyway. All I have in random gripes and criticism is is that the Digimon basically never lose any fights in the beginning, since every time the stakes are way too high in order to afford a loss. Stakes in a fight are important. If the winner or loss of a fight doesn't matter, then nobody cares about the fight. But if the loss is too disproportionate to the win, like if if you lose this fight, I'll kill everyone you know, then there's no possible way that the main character is going to freaking lose the fight if it's not the last episode. Stakes are very, very important in stories, and the stakes in this are way too high, again, to afford a loss. I think that the series would have been better if the Digimon lost a few more starter battles and gradually started winning, but that's more so a start of the series problem, and later on, they lose more fights, which make all their outcomes still predictable, but less so. Also, the amount of fake-out losses eventually lose their impact. Almost every fight, there's a fake-out loss, at least in the beginning, from what I remember. I'm pretty more than sure that, like, a lot, a lot of fights had some fake-out losses, where they clutched it nearly at the end, thanks to a special evolution to one of the Digimon. That was the beginning. Um, clutch evolution every time! I would've, you know, I also would've preferred if there weren't always clutch evolutions and they just learned how to do it, you know? I would've been, I would've been cool with that, honestly. Or if they very early on learn how to harness the power of their evolution and uh, evolve on command instead of just doing it fucking off screen. Anyway, every time I still got really into every fight, even though I knew that it was going to result in a win for the good guys. I mean, every final fight, you know, it's gonna it has to be a win for the good guys, right? Every final fight, that's understandable, right? I mean, that that should pass. But I still got really into it because I get into I just get into any show basically while I'm watching it and I normally feel I really get into them if I feel for the characters which I really do in Digimon. Digimon was fine I suppose I mean it certainly was a show wasn't a great one wasn't a bad one but it was a show that exists a fine show that and I can completely understand why so many people are nostalgic for this show because it wasn't bad and there are fun parts in good characters with well executed character arcs and also there are character arcs that could be incredibly relatable to people. Like with the divorced parents thing and the adoptive parent thing, I can't relate to either of those. Those could have been relatable and those could have touched people's hearts. And I think that's an expression that people still, I don't know if that's, is that outdated? I have no clue. But like, hey, the content here isn't bad. Your experience won't be super positive, but it also won't be negative. And you might also find a new series that you'll love. Because, I mean, it's not it's not bad at all. And probably the other series are better, I assume, maybe. This was the first, so. It's just a very average show here. 
in a lot of ways and also nonsensical in a few but would i recommend this show for a regular normal person who's not in search for a pokemon like show no even though it wasn't bad and i enjoyed it I'd still say that it's just slightly above average, nothing spectacular here, and really I'd only recommend a show to someone that I think is really freaking good. Or on the other end if it's really freaking bad, but Digimon wasn't either of these. The characters were deep in the, I understood them, but I don't think that that's all that makes it, I don't think that that's all that's needed to make a outstanding, spectacular show that everyone will have to watch and remember that's I don't think that that's what does it I don't want someone to go into a show and then come out being like oh that was fine I guess I don't I mean I don't have much to say about it but that was fine I mean would I watch it again no but did I dread my time watching it no I don't I don't want to subject someone to that kind of experience like the character arcs are great and everything else is fine and I think that the character arcs are what carried me through watching this show. I got to learn a few of the characters like they were actually people and I got to see how they grew and changed for the better. I think that that's mostly what Digimon is for, the fine writing with fine and good character arcs. But that alone doesn't make a spectacular series a show. It's a really good element that's incredibly important but still. Even the fights were animated high quality enough to recommend to folks who love action. It's just average action here. Sure, the moves are cool and pretty unique, but still, the animation is low budget. I mean, shits were used all the time. I will probably never watch another Digimon series again because I spent three days watching this one, unless this video does super well. And by super well, I mean like 500 views, which is unlikely, but whatever. Keep going, Digimon. I'm sure your other series are better. Or games. Specifically that weird Digimon Survive game. I mean, I'll have to check that out later. It actually looks kind of interesting. Survival Horror Digimon? Actually, I love that idea. That sounds like a great concept. Well, leave in the comments on what show you were nostalgic for that I should talk about next. I don't promise that I'll review it, but I might put it on my list for shows to review next. Anyway, thanks for watching me ramble for like 35 minutes because this is actually a 35 minute video. And I thought it would be like a 40 or an hour long video. That just goes to show you how much, how much I cut out, how many rambling sections I cut out and stuff like that. But yeah, subscribe and like and all the other stuff. Comment too and share this video. Yeah, um, bye.